After the end of the First World War, the attention of Americans began to refocus on the nation's history. In just a few years, they would celebrate the 150th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. Philadelphia seemed like the right place to organize this sesquicentennial event. In 1921, Philadelphia civic leaders started planning for the exposition. The Sesquicentennial Exhibition Association was incorporated to organize and manage the events. Preparation of the site first required the filling in of hundreds of acres of land before construction could begin. This photograph was taken at the current location of Citizens Bank Park, then 10th and Patterson Streets. The site chosen for the exposition was a large, undeveloped and swampy area of South Philadelphia at the end of Broad Street and just above the League Island Naval Base. Here is the site plan for the exposition. This newspaper article shows the general layout of the exposition at the top and some of the key buildings constructed. The exposition covered over 2,000 acres of land, including the construction of 46 major buildings, 250 pavilions, booths, and stands. The site contained four airfields. The federal government supported the project with a grant of nearly $2.2 million, a portion of which was to be used for repairs to the naval base, which would then be open to the public. A total of 43 countries signed on to construct exhibits, as well as 15 states, the federal government, and the U.S. military. The Navy opened the USS Constellation, now in Baltimore, and the USS Olympia, still in Philadelphia, for visitor tours. The Navy also spruced up its grounds and buildings, constructing a new gatehouse and entrance. Beautifully manicured lawns and flower beds greeted visitors as they made their way to see many exhibits and displays. The entrance to the fair was located at Broad Street and Packer Avenue. A great tree-lined boulevard was constructed from the main entrance from Packer Avenue to Patterson Avenue. A huge replica of the Liberty Bell was constructed at a cost of $100,000 and set in place on Broad Street at Oregon Avenue. The bell was illuminated by 26,000 15-watt bulbs. It stood over 80 feet high, straddling Broad Street at what is now Marconi Plaza. The bell proved to be one of the exposition's most popular attractions. Also, what were called the Founder's Pylons were constructed along Broad Street. These were 13 columns representing the original 13 colonies. Each had the state name along with the names of the signers of the Declaration of Independence from that state. The new Grand Gazebo was built as a scenic overlook. The city also constructed a new stadium built by the city at a cost of $2 million. It opened on the 15th of April. The field was illuminated by 190 projectors atop steel towers, each of which held a 1500 watt bulb. 
The stadium held 86,000 people. Events at the stadium included track and field competitions, baseball and football games, tennis matches, and many other events. One of the football games was between the Philadelphia Quakers and the Chicago Bulls. On the 23rd of September, one of the largest crowds in the country, 120,000, witnessed the Dempsey Tunney heavyweight boxing title match. Tunney defeated Dempsey in a 10 round decision. The fight occurred in the rain. Another remarkable feature of the exposition was the recreation of Colonial Philadelphia's High Street, today's Market Street. Great care was taken by the architects to detail and historic accuracy. Guides were dressed in period costume. However, as one visitor observed, the recreation was much cleaner than the original. One of the buildings reconstructed was the three-story house where Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence. Also, the Old Tun Tavern, which was built in 1693 and existed for 88 years at the corner of Tun Alley and King Street, later Water Street, and now a site several meters above the slow lane on Interstate 95, was recreated. This tavern carried the legendary significance of being the birthplace of the United States Marine Corps and the first Masonic Lodge. The building was demolished as soon as the exposition closed. The New Jersey building was a replica of the Trenton Barracks first used by the British and later by the Continental Army under George Washington. These statues were placed at the front of the Pennsylvania State Exhibit at Broad Street and Patterson Avenue. The Connecticut building was a reproduction of the old State House in Hartford. The dome on top of the building was a clock manufactured by the Seth Thomas Clock Company. This exhibit was located on Broad Street, across from the stadium. The Ohio building was a replica of the home of President William Henry Harrison. Furnishings included some of the President's original furniture. At the end of the exposition, the building was dismantled and reconstructed in Columbus, Ohio. During the exposition, it was located off Broad Street in the League Island Park. New York State's building was a replica of Federal Hall, where George Washington took the oath of office as the first president. On display were a collection of relics from the American Revolution. The exhibit was located on Broad Street. Moving on to the foreign exhibits, here is a photograph of the Persia exhibit. And another of the same building located overlooking Edgewater Lake. The India Pavilion was designed to resemble the Taj Mahal. Here is a view titled A Bit of Cairo through the Orient Concessions. Among the larger buildings was the Palace of Liberal Arts and Manufacturing a city block long exhibit hall located on the east side of Broad Street. The building housed 200 exhibits and contained 338,000 square feet.
within the building, the exhibit of the J.B. Van Sciver Company of Camden, New Jersey, was a model of a furniture factory. The John Wanamaker Stores exhibit was called Evolution of the American Flag. The International Business Machine Company had a business machine exhibit. Seen here in 1930, employees of IBM's Dayton Scale Company are assembling Dayton Safety Electric Meat Choppers. These devices won the gold medal at the exposition. Philadelphians had argued over competing visions for the exposition. Some argued for a celebration of culture or for the achievements of commerce. Both visions were represented at the exposition. Here is the display provided by a Japanese trade association. The Ivory Merchants Association of Tokyo, Japan also had an exhibit. Another exhibit was created by the American Eugenics Society. And here is the exhibit created by the Fixed Nitrogen Research Laboratory. The interior of the exhibit hall offered plenty of floor space for companies and other exhibitors. One of the stranger or more creative exhibits was this paper mache mock-up of a gas station. This is a photograph of the exhibit under construction. And here is the finished exhibit. Pre-opening publicity included postcards inviting the nation and world to attend the exposition and help celebrate 150 years of American independence. Planners anticipated the exposition would attract some 36 million visitors during six months of operation. A mission cost was 50 cents for adults and 25 cents for children. To help promote the fair, the U.S. Post Office issued a special stamp and a stamped envelope for visitors to keep as a souvenir. The U.S. Mint in Philadelphia issued two commemorative coins. Over 140,000 half dollars were produced with the profiles of Presidents Washington and Coolidge on the coins. $46,002.50 gold commemorative coins were also minted. The mint also produced a sesquicentennial dollar in copper, bronze, and brass and nickel that served as the official medal of the exposition. The first day attendance was over 82,000, of which some 55,500 paid for admission. The opening ceremonies, conducted in the heart of the city, were chaired by Philadelphia Mayor W. Freeland Kendrick. U.S. Secretary of State Frank Kellogg was also in attendance. As well as Secretary of Commerce Herbert Hoover. The 6th of June was declared Swedish Day. This was one of the first celebration days to occur during the sesquicentennial, taking place even before all of the landscaping and building on the grounds was completed. As part of the festivities, Crown Prince Gustavus Adolphus of Sweden and his wife, Princess Louise, visited the exposition four days earlier on the 2nd of June.
During their visit, the crown prince and princess took part in the dedication of a reconstructed early blockhouse. This building was originally constructed in 1669 and demolished in 1698 to make room for the old Swedes church. Swedish settlers retained usage of the Lenape place name, referring to the structure as the Wakako Blockhouse. The blockhouse was adjacent to the American Historical Museum. Today, a neighborhood park is named Wakako Park on the 400 block of Catherine Street. The second ceremony was held for the laying of the cornerstone for the John Morton Memorial Building. The building was to become home of the American Swedish Historical Museum. Completed later in 1926, the museum consists of 12 permanent galleries, one changing exhibition gallery, and a library. The building was modeled after a 17th century Swedish manor, which uses a timeline, tapestry, and artifacts to tell the story of the colonists who came from Sweden prior to William Penn. Years before William Penn and his Quaker followers set foot on America's shores, Swedish settlers had established a settlement along the Delaware River and Bay. From New York, the English administered the Delaware Valley and instituted two major systems for the courts and land ownership. Some Swedes, including Morton Mortensen, received patents for their land. In 1672, Governor Francis Lovelace issued a patent to him and two other landholders confirming their possession of more than 700 acres along Darby Creek. On this land, now part of both Pennsylvania and Delaware, stands the Morton Homestead. John Morton was one of nine Pennsylvania signers of the Declaration. He had replaced retiring William Peters as a representative for Chester County in a special election of the Pennsylvania Assembly on June 28, 1756. Except for nearly three years as the county sheriff, Morton remained in the assembly until it adjourned on September 26, 1776. He was the speaker during the assembly's final year and a half, a position he won by unanimous vote. Morton was also a Chester County Justice and later an Associate Justice of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. He was elected to the Continental Congress in 1774, 1775, and again in 1776. The YWCA building, located at Broad and Patterson Avenue, was a replica of Mount Vernon and contained a cafeteria that served over 302,000 people during the exposition. University of Pennsylvania had an extensive exhibit that included scientific instruments and specimens, original papers of famous colonial leaders, and a page from the Gutenberg Bible. The Royal Baking Powder Company opened a store within the Palace of Liberal Arts and Manufacturing building. The company had also exhibited at the Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia held in 1876. A tower of light stood between the Palace of Liberal Arts and the Palace of Agriculture, housing the model post office operating at the exposition. The Palace of Agriculture building was the largest at the exposition, containing 367,500 square feet of exhibition space. One exhibitor was Santos Coffee, sold at A&P stores, which also had an exhibit. National Home Electric was an exhibit sponsored by the Electrical Industry Association of Philadelphia. This attractive model home served to demonstrate all the modern conveniences that electricity could provide the average household. 
The completely furnished eight-room house contained electric devices from refrigerators and dishwashers to burglar alarms. League Island was used for several venues located on the south side of Patterson Avenue. The boathouse was turned into a Russian pavilion restaurant during the exposition. An amusement area was located within League Island Park. This occupied five acres and included a replica of the Canadian Rockies, a miniature railroad, a mountain slide, Robinson Crusoe's beach, a pirate's lair, and Noah's Ark complete with animals. Visitors could also see the Fokker F-7 aircraft that Admiral Richard E. Byrd used to fly over the North Pole on the 9th of May, 1926. A pageant was held called Freedom that involved over 3,000 performers. Other entertainment included 32 concerts by the Philadelphia Orchestra. Visitors were carried to and from the exposition site by electric powered tour buses operated by the Philadelphia Rapid Transit. And special trains called the Broadway Limited operated by the Pennsylvania Railroad ran overnight between Chicago, Philadelphia and New York City. Once visitors arrived in Philadelphia, some property owners offered their homes to tourists, including this six-bedroom, two-bath stone home at 6244 Wissahickon Avenue facing Fairmount Park. The owners offered it for rent for one, two, or three months during the sesquicentennial. Although the exposition was well promoted, nature did not cooperate. Out of the 184 days of the exposition, it rained on 107 days. Of the 36 million visitors expected, only 6.5 million actually came. The total cost for the exposition was estimated at $26 million with all of the buildings and exhibits valued at over $100 million. In early 1927, the Sesquicentennial Commission declared bankruptcy. The Mammoth Liberty Bell, constructed at a cost of over $100,000 and weighing in at 42 tons, was sold at auction as scrap for the sum of $60. It was dismantled in August of 1927. Afterward, a pictorial record of the exposition was published. Following 1926, the exposition was demolished and the U.S. Navy built temporary housing on the site. The Navy abandoned the site and moved families to new housing west of Penrose Avenue. This opened up the site to the private development of Packer Park on what was reclaimed swampy land. 